Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Robert, welcome back to Coast to Coast. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. I wanted, Before we jump into the main topic and talk about your book, I wanted to get your take about this NASA spacecraft, the return to Earth carrying material retrieved from an asteroid. I mean, an asteroid. It's sci-fi, becomes real science. I think we think it'd be a real proud moment for your friends and colleagues at NASA. Uh, yes. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm speaking as myself and not, as a, not on behalf of NASA. Oh, sure. I think it's just tremendously exciting. Uh, yes, this, uh, uh, the Osiris Rex, spacecraft uh, banged into a small um, asteroid a few um, football fields across and collected a sample and uh, has jettisoned it. And it just uh, just within the past 24 hours uh, came down in the Utah desert. And so it's been retrieved. It's chased by helicopters. You might say that an object from outer space crashed into Earth and on the way it was chased by helicopters and picked up and moved into a lab where we're going to study it. And that's exactly... What happened? But it's not an alien spacecraft. It's something we put up there, and it's really exciting because it's going to have. It has most probably um, dust from this asteroid that was uh, deposited there in the uh, early solar system, and so we might learn more about the early solar system. That's amazing. Well, it was alien to the asteroid, that's for sure. Uh, so, yeah. what, what? I mean, it's a dust. Are we going to have rocks? Is there anything else? What? The, what does this material look like? Just like dust from our planet? Well, again, I'm not an expert on this. Right. Um, this is not my 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 specialty is is other areas of astrophysics. But uh, so, um, I think it's a small rock uh, dust. Yeah, it's uh, it's not anything really large. Um, so they they impacted. Uh, it's like the spacecraft put out an arm and then banged into it into the surface and and loosened things that would come free. And then it, it uh, some of that fell into the spacecraft, the specific compartment in the spacecraft, and that closed up. And they think they have about uh, about you know a coffee cup size, maybe a little bit bigger than a coffee cup size of material, uh, mostly ground, not ground up because it grounds it up, but it was just uh, just dust and rocks. And so uh, and so yeah, and that that capsule has been returned, and uh, yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, we're gonna see if there was a lot of organic material in the early solar system, and um, maybe uh, the seeds for life uh, were out there. Uh, but uh, also, asteroid Beno, I understand, is a, a bit of a hazard risk in that it comes very close to the Earth every now and then. Oh. And so far as we can tell, in the near future, that won't happen. So nobody alive today has to worry about asteroid Bennu uh, hitting us. And if it did hit us, it wouldn't destroy life on Earth. It's not as big as the asteroid that, uh, that troubled the dinosaurs and killed off the dinosaurs. But it could cause some problems. And so... Um, so it's best to, to study it and understand it. Uh, so we, we, we're, there's no real trajectory that we know that it will impact Earth. It will come very close. And if we're, we, the, the more distant uh, trajectory of the asteroid is not all that well known. Uh, so it could, in several thousand, maybe millions of years, impact the Earth. But we now have the ability to, NASA, humanity has the ability to impact asteroids like this with small objects and slightly change their trajectory. And so if we find that uh, with, with future analysis that it might be hitting the Earth, we might be able to slightly nudge it so that it misses. I, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot because this wasn't the topic you were here to talk about, but you're as close as I get to NASA tonight and happen to be on the show. So that's why I was asking mm -hmm. the question. I just find it just astounding that we can shoot a rocket out at an asteroid that's traveling, hurtling through space, a small asteroid, intercept it, get some stuff and come back. It's just astounding to me, you know. Yes, it is amazing. We live in a in a futuristic world in many ways, uh, and uh, we're we have more spacecraft out exploring almost everything in the solar system. Every major planet has been visited, and now we're visiting lots of asteroids and even bringing them little bits of them back uh, to study. So we just don't have to see them through telescopes. We can actually um, study what the, what it is they are. I want to ask you about uh, the James Webb Telescope. 
uh, because, I mean, you deal with the images or the photos of the day. I'm sure some of those must come from James Webb. Uh, what uh, Can you address what that means to NASA, to the world, to science? Uh, what's happened that you've seen from the James Webb that's amazed even you? Okay. So uh, the James Webb is a, it's a new big telescope. It's bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope, several times bigger. Uh, it co-orbits the sun with the Earth. And uh, it sees uh, some red light that we can see, but mostly into the infrared. So it sees red light more red than humans can see. And so that's good because a lot of things emit light, like you and me, we emit light in the infrared much more than we do in the optical visible light that we're used to. And so when you look, see into the infrared light, you can see into dust clouds and you can see parts of the early universe that you couldn't see before. So what we're seeing is uh, images coming in of the inside of the nebula that we didn't know, uh, and we're seeing back to the early universe. Uh, parts of the early universe that we hadn't seen before. So we're trying to, we're figuring out how it is better that galaxies formed and planets formed. And yeah, because of the size of the telescope, we're just getting some tremendously detailed images. So it's visually just amazing some of the things that came back in. One thing I was surprised about is they're taking, is uh, that Webb is being pointed just at uh, objects inside our, tele inside our solar system. So there's a a picture of uh, Jupiter that's tremendously uh, detailed that we were, we've been able to feature. And you can see things in the infrared. You can see, actually, Saturn is famous for having rings. Well, Jupiter has some rings, and they glow a bit in the infrared. So we can see them, and we can see aurora on Jupiter, and we can see the interaction between uh, Jupiter's aurora and its uh, moon Io. Uh, so we're able to, to study that, the interaction of that in, in, in greater detail. But Webb is just... Uh, just doing great things. It's bigger than Hubble. Uh, Hubble complements it in some way. Hubble can see into the ultraviolet, which is light more blue than we can see. And there are advantages to being able to see into the ultraviolet. And Hubble sees the entire uh, visual range, too. Um, so the two telescopes actually can complement each other in many ways. But uh, we've never had a telescope like Webb before, so it's, uh, it's very exciting. Yeah, I mean, do you get a feed of the photos that come out of Webb, or you get your pick of those things for your uh, for your feature, the astronomy photo of the day? Well, we we don't have special inside information from that. So we see the amount the images that everyone else uh, that NASA releases. NASA is a very transparent organization. They when they take images of things, usually within a day or two, it's released into the public. So. Uh, we, we see that, too. But one of the things we do on the astronomy picture today is since we're uh, astrophysicists, we can explain it and we can put it in context in a very short explanation that's hyperlinked into the web. So we can pick out some of the images that are most visually stimulating. We can pick out some of the images that are, have the most science in them. And we can say, tell people very clearly and very, in very short text uh, what it is they're seeing and why it's important. The, the kind of information that comes your way every day, uh, it it, it would seem so overwhelming to me, and I, and I say it in the context of, you know, Webb, it sees so far out if you, if, you, if you target something way far out. And it's like the march of science, the march of knowledge is a, a lesson in increasing humility for we humans, how small we become the more we uh, learn about how big everything else is. Agree? Yeah. Uh, humanity keeps passing, as technology increases, humanity is able to do more and more. And sometimes you live in a part of humanity where things didn't really progress very much. So you pretty much study what's been known. But we live in a time when there's spacecraft that go out into the solar system and we can build telescopes that can see far out into the universe. So we are just seeing, we're like open field running. There's all this great stuff that's coming in. We live in a very fortunate era, a golden age of exploring the universe and seeing the universe. Uh, more than 100 years ago or so, we thought our galaxy was pretty much the whole universe. Uh, but now we know that all those little spiral nebula and all these other things are actually galaxies like our own. And we can see the outer universe expanding. And so even just in the past 100 years, there's been revolution of, after revolution of humanity's understanding of what universe is. And just seeing all these amazing things out there. And the latest chapters of that, well, there was Hubble, and now there's Webb. And, but there's also little, other little telescopes that fill in little niches that are important, too. And little spacecraft that go out, like, 
like Osiris Rex and uh, and capture little bits and coming back and and you know a hundred years ago this would be almost inconceivable. Actually, yeah, well, the, the lo- some of the science fiction writers of the day actually sort of saw some of uh, foresaw that some of this might happen, but uh, the average person on the street uh, would have no reason to think that, and now it's come true. You know, a century or more ago, uh, there were people, uh, scientists on Earth, who thought there was life on Mars. They saw the canals and figured they had been engineered. Uh, there, and then more recently, uh, people figured our solar system must be dead. There's no chance any life exists. The more we learn about our own solar system, the more possibilities of some kind of life uh, might be out there. These frozen moons and and uh, and maybe maybe ancient microscopic life still on Mars. Or uh, I mean, it's a really exciting time. Uh, even in our own little neck of the galactic woods here. Yes, it could be. Uh, the next major milestone for humanity is discovering uh, extraterrestrial life. And I know a lot of people uh, like like me think that it must be out there somewhere. And the big question is, how will we discover it? And so I was actually involved in organizing a debate a few years ago as to whether we would probably discover extraterrestrial life through what we call biosignatures, meaning that we would find something on Mars, something that landed on Mars would find something that would indicate that life existed there in the past. And, uh, or we could find it through technosignatures. We would get uh, some radio broadcasts uh, that would obviously indicate that there was extraterrestrial life out there. And, uh, or we would see some kind of technology out there that we obviously didn't develop. And so there's sort of a battle in the community now between how is, how is it that we will discover extraterrestrial life? Will it be through biosignatures? Will it be through technosignatures? But right now, every year that goes by, we keep expanding the frontier further and further, and yet we have no clear evidence of extraterrestrial life that is confirmed yet. And so it's exciting to, it's like sitting on the edge of the chair, your chair wondering which it will be. And we keep with Webb Telescope, Webb is looking at the, Extra exoplanets, planets orbiting other solar systems. We're looking for biomarkers in those exoplanets. Maybe there's something that clearly tells us there's life in on some of these exoplanets, uh, or um, or on Mars. Maybe something will be found that is uh, a clear signature of that. Or we're we're also listening in more and better ways into the solar system with with, with radio telescopes and uh, trying to listen in different places. And so far, we haven't heard anything that clearly and reproducibly uh, indicate indicative of extraterrestrial life. But it is it is possibly the next major leap of mankind to understand that we're not alone in the universe. Yeah, I, I, it's a very exciting possibility. I hope it happens in my lifetime. And I promise uh, we're not going to dwell too much longer on this. I want to jump into talking about your book and the ideas therein. But just one last question on this. I mean... You know, in my line of work, we cover a lot of really what you'd call pretty weird stuff, UFOs and things like that on this program. I'm not going to sort of pin you into into that area, but could you no, share... No, coast to coast. You're, you're... <laughs> could you share with me your thoughts on what happens, how humans, our civilization, reacts to the discovery and confirmation of ET life, even microscopic ancient life on Mars that's no longer there? How does that change things? Why would that be such a major development? Wow. So <laughs> that's a really great question. I haven't really put too much thought into it. It's like you, you kept trying to, to do something, and then when you finally do something, it's like, oh, now what? Now what? Um, <laughs> I think humanity would, would take it in stride. I think uh, a lot of humanity uh, does believe that we're not alone in the universe, and uh, there would be a lot of curiosity as to what is it that's out there. Okay, now they found it. What else is it that's like that? What what? So it was discovered. Let's say in bio. Let's say a biosignature was discovered on a moon of Jupiter. What is that? Are there fish down there? Um, are, are there frozen fish orbiting um, Jupiter that we just missed because they're so small? Uh, how do these things live? How do they see? Uh, are we related? Are they DNA? Like we're DNA? Are they are they based on something else? Uh, uh, is there and is, is, and then can you extrapolate on that? Do you expect is this a, just a solar system thing? Is this solar system just lucky to have lucky to have a DNA based life, or is this something that uh, you can see out in the universe? Uh, for instance, if you were to detect DNA based life out of an exoplanet uh, out of our solar system, that would indicate 
that the DNA is not so unusual. This way of reproducing ourselves is not so unusual. Or maybe it's something completely different. And I think it would just create in humanity a lot of curiosity as to how this happened and, and what, what are the future implications. Is there lots of life out there? Is there other intelligent life out there? I think it would be like going through a door of understanding and finding yourself in a new space and just wondering what it is that's in this space. Yeah, it'd be exciting to to figure out if panspermia is real, that uh, life was uh, came to Earth from somewhere else on an asteroid, on a comet, something like that. And, and if so, whether there's a common denominator between life here and life out there. Yes, exactly. These are questions that would be asked in, in, in greater detail than ever before. Were we, and hopefully when we, discover uh, extraterrestrial life? Um, about your book. So, look, uh, you know, a lot of people in my line of work, journalists, they chose this profession because it allowed us to uh, avoid math in part, you know, because math is hard. If you had been teaching physics when I was back in college, I might have paid closer attention because the, the, the book is so much fun. There are so many of the subjects that you cover in this uh, in this book, Faster Than Light, How Your Shadow Can Do It, But You Can't. Uh, you know, it's it goes over the heads of regular lunkheads like me, but you seem to have set out to make it fun for physics students and clear enough for the general public to follow along. Was that the goal? Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a bunch of interesting uh, concepts. So what I tried to do is I, there's a little bit of math, but I tried to stay away from the math. <laughs> As I say there, the, you know, a lot of science progresses with data. So a lot of the information is brought in, like the, uh, the, the sample from a Cyrus Rex is going to be analyzed and we'll have all this data. A lot of uh, things. So people, uh, humanity has created math to help us explain the data in some way. Here, here we're going to fit this data, and here's the relationship between the data. But at a higher level, in my view, higher than math is concept. And everybody can understand some of the really cool concepts. So in my book, I try to hand wave across the math and acknowledge the data, but not really get into much of the data at all, but try to focus on the really cool concepts that are behind uh, the, the, the greatest speed limit there is, which is the speed of light, because the speed of light is just a tremendously interesting speed limit, and it creates things like time dilation and uh, time travel certainly into the future and strange little paradoxes that come up, but it's not impossible to understand without yeah. math and data and without math in particular. Uh, Re- so I try to Retro right. causality, Robert Nemiroff, uh, faster than light, how your shadow can do it, but you can't, is really good. Uh, is this uh, material taken from lectures that you've given or you pulled it together over the years? Well, I've always had an interest. For many, many years, I had an interest, and I've actually published on some of the strange aspects in, in science journals um, some of the strange aspects that uh, shadows and laser spots can do when they when they go faster than light, because uh, even the, the physics community, once they see the logic, they don't disagree with it, but uh, but they're unaware of it. So if you were to go and speak to uh, someone you know that's versed in physics, they would say, oh, no, no, that can't happen. But once you explain to them the logic of how it does happen, they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of cool. And it is. It's, it's really strange. It's just one of these untold stories out there that uh, there's this whole universe of things that happen faster than light that, that we don't know. For instance, uh, when you turn on a room light, the, the room, at first the room is completely dark. And after a second, for sure, the room's completely illuminated. Well, the boundary between dark and light moves across the wall faster than light. <laughs> so if you could see at those speeds, you would be able to see a much different universe. You would see lots of things moving faster than light all the time. And so one of the reasons why we can't do it, why we can't see it, is because our brains and minds are so slow, that was me, uh, <laughs> that, um, that it just doesn't come through. But now with modern technology, we can have time, rapid time-lapse photography and see these things. Uh, you drop a lot of really cool historical facts in the book about, how you know, the... Uh the understanding of the speed of light, how it developed and changed over the centuries. Maybe let's start there. I mean, uh, tell us a little bit about and what you cover in the book about uh, the first folks to try to measure the speed of light. Is it Galileo or be- even before well, that? People have been 
been speculating about skin light since, uh, since the, uh, in most of recorded history. Um, for instance, um, as you noted, uh, let's see, Aristotle and Euclid back in, in the you know, BC times, uh, they sort of thought that um, they sort of thought that what happens is light doesn't come from an object from a star or from a light to you. Light goes from your eye to the object you're seeing. And for most of human history, that's the way humans thought it was. Uh, every now and then, someone would say, no, wait, I think it's the other way. But, but that was not what most people believed. And it was only around 1,000 A.D. that, uh, that, that it was more and more realized that, no, 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 that, that's not the way it is. Light actually comes, goes from something and comes to us. And that's when – so back in the, the B.C. times, People thought, well, the speed of light must be uh, infinite because when your eyes are closed, you don't see something. And then when you open your eyes, then light goes out from your eyes, and you can see things, even stars that are far away. Therefore, the speed of light must be effectively infinite. But once people realized that light was coming from other things into their eye, then people realized, well, maybe it's not infinite. Maybe it's, it's got some speed. But for many years, they just couldn't measure it. It was so fast. As I like to tell my students, uh, there's really only three numbers in, in conceptual astrophysics. One is infinity, which means it was really too, too fast or too big to measure. One is one, means that we measured it, it's one of those. And the other is zero. Uh, the, other thir the third number in astrophysics is zero because it means it's too small to measure. It might be there. We don't know what size, but it's effectively zero. So for a lot of human history, the speed of light was infinite because it was just too fast to measure. We, we couldn't do it. So people like Galileo, they, they tried to do it. They would go to mountaintops or hilltops, and then someone else would be in another hilltop, and they had lanterns, and they had um, black um, things they could, you know, they could put over the lanterns. And so they would make deals. They go, you and your, your hilltop, when you see me uncover my lantern, you uncover your lantern. And I'll count the amount of seconds it takes before I can see your lantern. And so Galileo did this, and other people did this, and they found out, well, it's about a second. No, it's about two seconds. No, it's about half a second. And they realized they weren't getting a consistent answer. And Galileo realized that, no, I just don't believe it. If it was infinitely fast, what we're really measuring is how long it takes to uncover the lanterns. We're not really measuring anything to do with the speed of light. So Many efforts to measure the super fast speed of light just failed until suddenly in the 1600s, someone who was not famous just happened to be doing something that some people didn't, you know, didn't think would be all that interesting, and they got a result that they didn't understand. But that result was the door. That door that, was, that we went through is the finite speed of light, and that person was Ole Romer. And Ole Romer, what they were doing is they were just watching the moons of Jupiter. And the moons of Jupiter, particularly Io, would go behind Jupiter, go in front of Jupiter. And Romer noticed there was just something odd about the timing of these eclipses. And the eclipses would take longer in some circumstances and shorter in other circumstances. And it just didn't seem to make sense. And so meanwhile, uh, on the other people were on the next hill trying to uncover lanterns. Uh, but uh, Romer was saying, hey, wait a minute. Uh, can you understand this? And the answer, it turns out, that Ole Rummer was actually the first to discover the finite speed of light and to measure it uh, within a, a small fraction, of the, not super accurately, but relatively accurately, uh, like, we, like we know it today. So the discovery was just a bit of a surprise, and it advanced human, human knowledge in a great way by just a, sort of a serendipitous result. Uh, you write a couple of different places in the book about there being more than one speed of light. Can you explain that? Yes. Yeah, so now we know, in modern science, we know a lot about the speed of light. And we know that the speed of light in objects, so when you look through water, the speed of light in water is not the same as the speed of light in air or in vacuum. Speed of light through air and vacuum are actually very similar. It's very small fractional percentage difference between those. But in water, it's like a third slower. Uh, but there's different even kinds of light. We now know things about what, the way light works, and there's phases, and there's, there's something called the group velocity. The group velocity is more or less how long it would take light to go from you to a mirror to bounce back. If 
you measure that speed, which we can now do with great accuracy, you're measuring the group velocity of light. There's also things called the phase velocity, whereas if you measure how much light is deflected, uh, that tells, but that's not all that important, really. It's important for understanding the details of physics and how things work. But in terms of the conceptual speed of light, we now know that you know, the speed of light in glass is different than the speed of light in water. And the speed of light in water is different than the speed of light in air, which is slightly different than the speed of light in vacuum. And the fastest that we know that anything can pass you by is the speed of light in vacuum. And so we call that the speed of light. But it really means fastest speed that we know of in terms of something that has energy and mass can go. I understand the speed of light is not just an exercise in and of itself. I mean, it helps to understand uh, the, the much bigger picture of the universe we live in and, and the nature of reality, right? Yeah. So uh, light is just a fundamental thing. It's one of the um, – it used to dominate the universe. The, the photons that, that make up light used to have the most energy in the universe. But now the universe has evolved. The, the light has, has become less comparatively energetic, whereas uh, mass and now something called dark energy have not diluted like light. So now light is, there's lots of, there's like billions of uh, pieces of photons for every atom in, that we know of, but still the amount of energy in light is, is down, has gone down down a lot. And so um, now light is more, is, isn't most useful for its mass and its energy. Doesn't it, the energy it has is most useful for what it can tell us because it's across the universe from far away. And so when we look at it near and far, and we we can try to decode what it is. Light was created someplace. Light was reflected from someplace. Light was emitted from someplace. And we 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 piece together the universe from the light we see, pretty much. Um, you have some fun exercises in the book. I, there's no way we can cover all of them, but one of them early in the book is an aside where you, you know, the title is Nothing Can Go Faster Than Light, which is, I think, probably the general assumption that most of us non-scientists uh, would suggest. But you say that if you were to head into the local university and ask a random physics student if anything or if shadows could go faster than light, you're probably going to get an answer, no, nothing could go faster than light. But they'd be wrong, right? Yes, they would be wrong. So. <laughs> Um, I, it's it's uh, an amazing thing. I've given talks, uh, and I've had you know good physicists in the audience object, saying, "Oh no, that can't happen." And then when I try to detail it, they don't even want to let me continue. So we get into an awkward part <laughs> where I say, "Oh no!" But then I speak at another university that has uh, that has just as prestigious scientists, and they love it. They say, "Oh yeah, this is really interesting. This is really great." So, yeah, if you were to go into this department, um, you might find people there who would seem to disagree with this. But unless what you can do is you can tell them to, to look up my articles, not only my articles, there are other articles, and then to read this book. And it really it makes it very clear. Uh, and it's been measured in the lab, too, that shadows and laser spots and illumination fronts, like, like when you turn on a light in a room, they, they all can move, and they do move uh, faster than light. And you say you wrote that you've submitted papers to recognize physics journals and had them rejected because the editors say, oh, no, there's no way this paper is flawed because nothing can go faster than light. They're wrong. Yes, yeah, <laughs> that has happened, too. So what happens is we we have editors that know. Uh, so when you send in, you, you do some research, you send it into a journal. So the journal, uh, you send it in to the editor, signs an editor. Then the editor has what's called referees. You can picture there are scientists who sit around with stripes on them, and they advise the editor as to whether this piece of science writing that was submitted to the journal should be published or not. Uh, many things submitted to journals are not published because the, the, the editor, on advice of the referee, usually says, oh, no. So um, we now know for some journals, some editors are, are clued in and they understand what we're doing and that this is correct. But if we get the wrong editor and the wrong editor submits it to the wrong referee, then we just get back a rote rejection, which we know to try to push past. We try to find, we ask that editor to send to a different referee or we ask that, that another editor uh, take over. And so uh, since we are able to publish our stuff, that is a, a successful tactic, but you're right. We've gotten just, you know, back an immediate thing saying, oh, no, this can't be right because someone hasn't thought it through. They just they remember some, you know, some adage that says nothing can go faster than light, but that, which is nothing can pass with mass can pass you faster than light. So far as we know, we don't have any examples of that. But shadows can go. 
Laser spots can go, or things can go, and these things can be very, very interesting and tell us things about the universe that we didn't know before. Yeah, you have one experiment in, in the book that uh, where you point a laser pointer at the moon, and it can go, you can whip it around, and it could go faster than the speed of light. Correct? Yeah. So, yeah. so one of my favorite, uh, favorite thought experiments, and there's a lot of conceptual thought experiments in the book, is let's say you're, you're, on, you're here on Earth, and let's say there was this big dome out one light year away. So if it's one light year away, it takes light a whole year to get there. So now you have your laser pointer. Uh, so you take your laser pointer and you point it at one spot in the dome. And even though you pointed it there, it's going to take a year for light to get there. But then in one second, you take your laser pointer and you shift it around to 180 degrees around to the, uh, to the other side of the dome. So after a year uh, that takes light to get there, the laser spot will cross, will go all the way around that dome uh, in, in a second. But that dome has... Uh, has a rate as a circumference greater than a light year, so that spot is moving greater than a light year in a second, which means the spot has a superluminal speed. Now, there's no information being created on the dome that's moving on the dome faster than light. The laser spot is the superposition of unrelated photons that are hitting at different places, and so that is what is appearing appearing to move uh, faster than light. But yes, yeah, these things. You know, we don't have a dome out at one light year. But these thought experiments are, are very clear demonstrations that uh, things, laser spots can move. So if you take your laser spot, maybe we don't have a dome a uh, light year away. What we do have is things that are closer. So the moon, if you just try your local wall and you take your laser pointer and you sweep it around the wall, you can't move your arm fast enough to make it go fast and light, unfortunately. But the moon is far enough away that if you take your laser pointer and you sweep it past the moon at a reasonable speed, not too fast, that that laser spot, if you could see it, would move faster than light across the moon. You have a, a chapter that deals with how to make a magnetic field move faster than light. So what is there a simple answer to that, a simple explanation that we would understand? Well, yeah, that's a tough one. Because, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. but the magnetic field lines are actually not something you can grab onto. They're conceptual lines of, uh, of, uh, of that have something to do with magnetism. So, yeah, so we draw them in, and then when the magnetism changes, you turn a magnet or something like that. Yeah, these magnetic field lines can, can move faster than light. That, that's very clear. But uh, it's not that easy to explain. So I did get, go to some effort in the book to do it. But I don't know if that would work here in the in the coast to coast format okay. very well. Uh, you know, you do touch on here and there um, the differences uh, between relativity and quantum mechanics. And try as I might to get my head around it, I just can't do it. But it seems to be a lot of what quantum mechanics concludes to be real and true is at odds with uh, what we think of as relativity. I don't know how they coexist, but they do, right? Yeah, so they are not in – we don't always know how they interact, and we're sometimes surprised, but there is – quantum mechanics does not contradict special relativity. In fact, there's a, there's a, uh, con, there are types of quantum mechanics, uh, quantum electrodynamics and, and things like that that uh, incorporate special relativity into them. Uh, the classic quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation it's called, uh, that can be brought into conflict with uh, the concept of special relativity. But, but physicists do know that special relativity is right and that it does fit into quantum mechanics. But that doesn't mean there's, there's some really strange quantum mechanics experiments out there that it appears that information is being transferred faster than light, but it is not. When it is, when it is looked at it in very detail, it's just the appearance that it is. It's not really going faster than light. And how that is is just absolutely fascinating, how it seems like something on one side and something far away, they seem like they know about each other, but they're not communicating. And so if you look at the details of it, which I try to explain in some of the chapters in my book, you can see that there's no real communication going on there. There's correlation, which we don't understand why there's correlation, but there's no communication. Robert, let's jump into some cool stuff here. Entanglement, you know, spooky action at a distance, what Einstein called it. Is that uh, related to the speed of light? I mean, how, how could two particles on opposite sides of the universe be connected somehow? I, I have a hard time getting my head around that one. Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. But if you would allow me to, 
to build up to that with a sure. digression or two, which I think that your coast to coast audience would appreciate. Sure. So the speed of light we know now is is constant. So whatever you see out there, you're not seeing it as it is right now. You're seeing as it was in the past. So that thing across the room, yeah, that's not the way it is right now. That's in the past. That car out there, no, no, it's it's a little bit different maybe now. You're seeing it in the past. When you look into a mirror, you don't see your present self. You see yourself as you were in the past. Now, it's a very, very slight fraction of a second in the past, but you can fix that in theory by moving the mirror far away. So in theory, if there was a mirror far enough away, and if you could see it, you could see yourself as when you were a child. I wish. There's nothing. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing against the laws of physics. That's what the laws of physics predict. Uh, it's a far enough away. In fact, light circles around a black hole. So in theory, if you could have a big enough telescope and decode the radiation enough, there is images of yourself when you're a child that circle a black hole and are on the way back now. Uh, but we just don't have the technology to see it. So you can only, you can only see the past. And one of my favorite phrases is, which I, I think I, I, is in the book, is you can only see the past, but you can only predict the future. <laughs> and there's another really cool thing that, I, that comes up in the book, too, is that even though you can see yourself in the mirror, you're not really seeing your true self. Most people have never seen their true self. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that uh, the air re-radiates. You see yourself through air. And air re-radiates a version of you. This is an effect that was actually discussed by Ewald and Osteen uh, in, in 1915. There's something called the extinction length. So the extinction length of the light that you, you admit that, and that we see in air is only around a millimeter or so. So if you look at yourself in the mirror, you're not seeing your true self. You're seeing a re-radiated version of yourself through the air. Um, and through water, it's even less. So uh, you have to really put your eye right up to your skin to see a little bit of yourself for the first time. Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd hit some background with that. I thought your Coast to Coast audience might, might appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, you um, know, we've so, had guests uh, who look at um, reality existing uh, only for the, for the benefit of the observer. That uh, I think you wrote that the moon would still be there even if we weren't looking at it. But I think... It's, I sense that you give some credence to the observer effect. Am I wrong? Yeah, so what we see can be very different from what we consider to be objective reality. Subjective reality, we build up objective reality from all of our subjective observations. And we say, okay, I'm seeing this, and this person's seeing that, and let's put this all together and figure out what objective reality is. And usually we can do that. There's some really strange cases where it's not really clear how to build objective reality from what people see. And one thing is about these spots that move faster than light. So if you have a spot moving toward you, a laser spot moving toward you on the wall, faster than light, which can happen, uh, there's only one spot in this case moving toward you. But what you see is when that spot toward you, when the speed of that spot toward you drops, from the speed of light toward you to less than the speed of light, then you see what's called a relativistic image doubling event. You suddenly see a pair of spots, and one goes one way and one goes the other. Because before, when it was moving toward you faster than light, it was preceding the light. So then when it drops to lower than the speed of light, the light precedes it. And so the way that you see that is that you see a pair of spots just go off in different directions. So that's what you subjectively see. Uh, but from that, you can build up the idea that there was just one spot moving across faster than light. This is one of the surprising things uh, that can happen uh, with, uh, with um, speed of light type, type stuff. It's just a, there's a lot of surprising concepts there. And I'm always surprised. I sometimes stumble across another one, and I say, really? Wow. <laughs> and, uh, again, what is objective reality? All we see is subjective reality, and subjective things are different. For instance, just the Doppler shift. So a car moving toward you sounds higher pitched than a car moving away from you. So those are just subjective hearing of what a car is. But objective reality might be considered the sound that car makes or the car horn makes that doesn't have the Doppler shift moving toward you or away from you uh, involved in it. So what we do is we say, okay, I see, I hear a car moving toward me. I hear the sound of the horn. I now know that it's moving toward me, so the sound of the horn is a higher pitch than it really is. 
So I reconstruct objective reality. The sound of the horn is, is there's actually a little bit of a lower tone there. And then I know that when I speak with somebody else, I don't tell them what I heard because that's just me. I tell them what it is, that sound that was being emitted by the car in the car's own frame. And they can say, oh, yeah, I can reconstruct that as well. So, yeah, this objective reality thing, it's there. We can reconstruct it from what it is we see. And what we can see sometimes can be very strange. Uh, dark matter and dark energy, those both strike me as strange. I mean, uh, is there a way where the speed of light calculations help us understand those? And by the way, where the heck are they? Why haven't we found them? Okay, so um, yeah, dark, dark matter and dark energy, I don't think they're directly related to speed of light effects, although we see them across the universe, and it takes light a long time to get to us uh, from there. So yeah, so uh, turns out in the last you know, 50 years, last 20 years, in fact, uh, looking at distant galaxies, we found out that they're moving away faster, and also galaxies inside, stars moving inside of galaxies, they move strangely. Galaxies moving inside of clusters of galaxies, they move strangely. They're moving strangely fast. And so what is it? If they're, what, can hold, what gravity must hold them in there, these stars moving around our galaxy? And so either the, the theory of gravity is slightly wrong, which many people believe, or more popularly, there is something called dark matter there that emits gravity like regular gravity that we're used to, but we don't see the light from it. So the stars moving in the outskirts of galaxies, they're not only responding to the light uh, that, from the mass that we see from the light that it emits, but we're, they're reacting to a matter we don't see. So that's called dark matter. And a good fraction of the universe is thought to be dark matter, which is different from mostly the matter that we're made, at, made out of. But besides that, in more recent times, we've seen that galaxies, are moving away from us faster than we can explain. And so we now think that there's not some, something even more strange than dark matter, and that is called dark energy. And this is a gravitationally repulsive force or energy that we didn't really know, we still don't know what it is. What I like to think of is that if you go back a thousand years, uh, people don't know almost much about air. They know a few things. They can say, oh, look, that leaf is fluttering because of air. I feel wind because of air. But we really didn't know much about air. We would have thought that the most massive things are the objects that you see, that rock over there or something. But it turned out that the, collectively the air between you and the rock probably is more massive than the rock. And now we know air is is there, and air is very interesting. Air is made of oxygen and nitrogen, and oxygen is really important. It helps us. We breathe in. Well, we breathe in all the air, but the oxygen is really important for us uh, to survive. But we didn't know that a thousand years ago. We just knew there was something called air. So now with dark energy, we know there's something out there called dark energy, but we don't know much about it at all. Maybe if we know more about it, there's things that are like oxygen about it. There's things that allow us maybe to move in ways that we can't picture now. Right now, we think that locally we're, we're, we're confined to the speed of light. But we know that distant galaxies are expanding out uh, far away from us uh, faster than light. So maybe there's a clue for that if we understand uh, dark energy. And tying it back to the beginning of the show, maybe we'll learn more about that uh, with uh, the web so James Webb Space Telescope might tell us more about that. It, it gets pretty lonely, the feeling, when you, you read your, your book in the sense of the universe expanding and galaxies going away from us faster than the speed of light. I mean, if we were still around in billions of years, or maybe more than billions, um, it'd be awfully lonely because we couldn't see any other galaxies, I guess. Well, so galaxies right in... in Objective reality, the gal some galaxies far away, they're, they're so far away that we will never reach them. But they admitted light in the past that we can see. So we can still see those distant galaxies. We can see an increasingly dim and red version of them sort of frozen in time. But uh, so we're always going to be able to see the microwave background, which is the early part of the universe, and, and distant galaxies. But, but that's because the light we see took a long time to reach us. So, but right now, if we could go to where they are right now, yeah, they're, they're out so far that we can't communicate them. If we were to take our, our laser pointer and shine at them, they'd never see it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, the, the, the size of our universe, you wrote uh, that for all intents and purposes, it might as well be infinite to us. But is it infinite? I mean, does 
And if there is an end to it, what's on the other side of that? Okay, so we, we just don't know. We're on size scale. So humans know things on human scale. So we know things that are about one human mass, you know. And as technology expands, we can go to see the very small and we can go to see the very large. But things on the very small are more typically dominated by quantum mechanics. And things on the very large are more typically dominated by uh, general relativistic Einsteinian cosmology. And these are things we don't usually see much of on our human scale. So we're expanding into realms that we're not familiar with, and we see things that we just don't completely understand. So the size of the universe, we don't have a lot of information on the real size of the universe. We know, given this finite speed of light, the observable universe, we can look at things in the observable universe, but when you talk about the entire universe, that's out past the observable universe, and it, science hits a frontier. We don't know. We don't know things in the very small. They're too small to for us to really understand. We don't know things on the very large. It's just too big to understand. But as the science progresses, as telescopes like Webb are able to understand more and see out further, we get to understand more and more on scales that are different from our human scale that we understand the best. Let me ask you this. I don't remember reading this in the book, so I'm, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. But, you know, they, uh, there are are some cosmologists who think that our universe is one of many, that there are other bubble universes bouncing up against each other. And I wonder if you've thought about the possibility that dark matter, dark energy uh, that we detect or suspect is here might be in something that's next to our universe. Well, we detect things that are in our own universe. It's, there's, what's great is once you realize that there's other things out there, it leads to a tremendous amount of speculation. And which parts of speculation are true or untrue are only uncovered as we understand more and more about, about science. So whether there are a causally disconnected universes out there, like we might be in this bubble, sort of like Earth is a bubble and then Mars is like a separate bubble, although we're not outside each other's universes. We're sort of in our own little bubble. There might be a separately causally connected, disconnected universe, many, many, many of them maybe, out there. But we don't know that for a fact. It's just tremendously fun to speculate, but we don't have any specific data that says that that's really true. You're a sci-fi fan, I know, so I, I'm sure you've thought about this, and you do go, in, go into it a little bit. Retrocausality. So I have some physicist friends, and we do chat back and forth about the idea of retrocausality, and some of them think that events in the future can affect the past, that retrocausality is, is, uh, is real. Where are you on that one? Yes. Now, I believe that there is something called retrocausality, but it does not allow you to communicate with the past. But things you do might affect the past. And it's really strange, and it takes me several chapters in the book of doing little bits of concepts here, first this, then this, then this, uh, to, to, to build up to that. But basically, uh, it, so if you have um, some experiment that happens somewhere, and then two particles uh, go out, and you measure one, and then the other particle is really far away, what you measure can be correlated with what is measured for that other particle. But you can't communicate that because you, what you measure for your particle is essentially random, and what the other person far away measures for their particle is essentially random. Uh, but when you get together later, when you send out a signal at the speed of light saying, here's what I measured, you can determine that there was a correlation. And people wonder, how could there be this correlation? It seems like these particles must have been communicating faster than light. And not only that, but since I measured in this in a certain way, it seems that the way I measured it seems to correlate with that faraway particle. And that far, far, faraway particle could have been measured in the past, not even now. And so it seems that something I've done now seems to have affected the past. But it doesn't allow communication in the past because what happens is now we measure something random, and in the past they measure something random, and only later do we look at the correlations and we say, oh, wow, they're oddly correlated. But since it seems random to the people in the past, and what we see, we, it doesn't tell us anything. It's like noise. We see noise. We think, you know, maybe this noise is telling us something, but we don't have a key to, to understand that. And the only way we know to get the key is to send it at light speed. And when you do that, you can't communicate with the past. And I try to, I, I go to some effort to explain this little bits at a time in the book, but retrocausality yeah. is a fascinating concept. And not everybody thinks that there is retrocausality. There are many physicists who think there are, and there are many physicists who think there are not. They think that the, possibly these 
we just live on the billiard the billiard table of life, and the balls are just bouncing into each other, and it was all predestined from long ago. And so what you're seeing and what happened in the past are all part of a causal chain that you just didn't know about before. So these are two things that kind of fight. There's the predestination on one side, and there's the retrocausality on the other side, and they kind of fight. But we haven't been able to come up with any experiment that distinguishes between the two. They all are, are consistent with modern quantum mechanical predictions. Uh, Robert, the sci-fi fan, would probably enjoy the idea of time travel, us going back from now and go see some dinosaurs. But Robert, the scientist, has doubts about, uh, you have just said, we can't send, we can't communicate with the past. So sending a person back there seems even more unlikely, I guess, right? Yeah, so we, I don't know, we don't know of any way to send information. If you send a person back, they would have information. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we don't know of any way to do that. The only the only, even in retrocausality, the only thing that's sent back is, is information but that's not a message. It's just something random that only later uh, can be correlated. But, yeah, the science fiction, Robert, uh, would love to speculate about that. And if for some reason you could walk into a time machine uh, in your basement and come out a year later, uh, then, as I point out in the book, you can just do anything for a year, uh, and maybe invest in the stock market, that, this, quote, future, unquote, stock market, and become rich. <laughs> Uh, but then if you go across the street, and then, and then after one year passes, so you went into your time machine, you went back a year, then you waited out a year, and then you come back. Then after one year later, you're at a different place. You can say, okay, uh, information then had to go from, from where you used to be when you went into the time machine to where you ended up later instantly. So instantly means faster than light. So if you could go back in time, then you could communicate faster than light. But we don't know of a way to send people back back in time. You know, I, I did a research project before about uh, looking for time travel, and uh, I got a lot of email, some email from people who were really wanted to know how to go back in time. And I had to tell <laughs> them, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't tell you how to do that. Robert, uh, not to put you on the spot here, but I mentioned about this article that we had posted about a mirror universe that quantum researchers think they've discovered a doorway or something. Does that ring a bell with you, or you'd rather pass on that one? Oh, it might surprise you and your audience. You know, I'm a bit of a skeptic on many things. Uh, so I don't know a lot about that specific claim, but I've heard previous claims sometimes by some pretty prestigious physicists. But in my experience, they just don't pan out. I mean, it makes for tremendous reading and makes for great speculation. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the universe is strange in different ways than that. So unfortunately, I, I'm not a, I don't know it that well, but similar claims that I've never been convinced of in the past. I'll send it to you afterward, and maybe we continue the conversation another time. As I mentioned, yeah. you're a big sci-fi fan, so you, yeah. you know about uh, Star Trek and Mr. Sulu pop it into Warp Factor 9. We don't have that yeah. capability. I don't know that we ever can have that capability. You write that, you know, mass doesn't travel that fast, and we don't know a way to make it happen. Uh, is is there um, is there some kind of an engineering solution that you could foresee some of the more exotic kind of propulsion technologies that are imagined? You write in your book about things that are inside of something else can travel faster than the speed of light. Well, if you have... Um if you have a particle or, or you're in a spaceship that enters water, it will slow down quickly, but uh, the speed of light in water is, is, is less than the speed of light in air. But if you have a particle or a bullet that goes in water, at first it goes faster than the light in water. And then what happens is it causes the water particles to jiggle and it emits something called a Trenkov radiation. Uh, but so it, that's not against the laws of physics. It's just uh, uh, that light slows down faster than other particles you know, when light enters water, it immediately slows down to, to less than it is in air. But other things don't slow down that fast. That means if you had a race down the swimming pool between a, a, a proton, say, or, and, and light, uh, the proton might win. Particularly, there's a particle that goes through water very easily called a muon. And a muon would easily beat a photon down the length of a, a pool of water. Uh, so one thing, though, you reminded me of is that there's a... There are ways to go out into the universe. You can go even to a star uh, 100 light years away uh, in your lifetime. Uh, so that, you know, Einstein's special relativity allows that with uh, length and time contractions. So when you go fast, uh, when you go compared to Earth, then uh, the universe in front of you shrinks up so that you can actually go hundreds of light years away in your lifetime. 
And then you can stop and you can come back. And when you come back, you would find what's commonly called the twin paradox. It's what you would see in, let's say, Planet of the Apes. You would come back and you would find that Earth has progressed far into the future. Maybe humans have now become, is now somehow succeeded to, into apes. But you're just a few years older than you were. And that's a well-understood effect and has actually been tested by putting atomic clocks in, in airplanes and, and flying them around on a very small scale. The atomic clocks have come back and we have recorded less time than the similar clocks on Earth. So you can do a, what is essentially warp one or warp two in your frame. Now, here on Earth, we would see the spaceship. We wouldn't see it so fast. Right? We would say, oh, it took about... You know, at fastest, it would, at most, it took a light year. It took a year for it to go a light year away. But if you're on the spaceship, you say, oh, well, no, I can do that. If I have the technology, I can go to a star one light year away in just a few minutes. Uh, so we can go out into the universe with technology and see things that are light years away. And that seem like warp speed, as shown in, in Star Trek. And it doesn't violate the laws of physics. It's predicted by Einstein's special relativity. But it's slightly different than, than depicted in Star Trek. The universe is a strange place. And it's strange in strange ways. And so sometimes these ways aren't convenient for science fiction stories. Although there are some really great science fiction stories uh, that do incorporate the correct special relativistic effect. Star Trek just seems to jump into warp speed, meaning that it's uh, superluminal in everybody's frame, faster than light in everybody's frame. But so far as special relativity is concerned, you can go warp speed, but when you come back, the Earth has progressed much further than it's shown in places like Star Trek and Star Wars. I've read some interesting papers written for government programs where they speculate about warp drive and how it might work. They speculate about wormholes as being shortcuts. Any um, any thoughts on those? You think that's that's pretty far out there? So again, the skeptic in me comes forward and says, nah. "Yeah." So uh, there's this uh, a lot of discussion on the web about something called the M drive that supposedly NASA is converting, creating. But uh, so when I checked into that. I don't see anything I find convincing, and they never seem to come up with anything that, that shows anything definitive. So when you come up with a new theory, you have to convince the scientific community that what you came up with is true. So what you do is you make predictions. You can say, well, if you take these observations, you would see this, which modern science, modern theories don't say. And so you go and you look and you see which way it is. And things like that so far have not been able to out-predict what, what relative, what modern science, with its understanding of relativity and quantum mechanics, says. So it's fun to speculate again, but so far uh, hasn't hasn't produced anything unexpected. Let's take some calls. Uh, the lines are pretty full. We're gonna we got Steve back here in Las Vegas on the west of the Rockies line. Steve, what's on your mind? Ah, good morning, gentlemen. Yeah, I did have a question and an observation. Uh, starting with that, um, using the example of like sticking your hand out the window of a moving car, you feel the air pressure, which is invisible, pressing against your hand. So using that uh, context, is there something in the vacuum of space that prevents the speed of light from going faster than the speed of light? Uh, something that we haven't uh, acknowledged or been able to measure yet. And uh, the other observation I had was you were talking about uh, increasing the speed of light by taking a laser, shining at the moon, and then moving the laser slightly so it goes from one side of the moon to the other would exceed the speed of light. And I liken that to like taking a uh, – again, that goes under the assumption that the light is a solid beam that can't be bent. Now, uh, what I'm thinking is, is that if you take a garden hose with a constant pressure, fire it at a, uh, the side of the wall of the garage, uh, the stream is constant, but it creates the illusion of bending – so whatever comes out of the end of the hose on your end uh, will basically reach the other side of the garage, but uh, it's still traveling at constant velocity, and I say the same thing with the laser beam. Well, Steve, actually, uh, uh, Robert has some interesting experiments or proposed experiments in his book. Robert, you want to tackle that? Well, basically, I would agree with almost everything that caller said, which might surprise the caller. So first of all, let's talk about if you had the – you can create – if you have a um, – if you have a, a garden hose and you have a wall and you can move the water, moves the garden hose at less than the speed of light, but it can create a wet spot that moves across the wall faster than light. But that's just the unrelated superposition of water molecules hitting the wall. It's not, there's no, at no time does water ever go faster than light. So this is just a, an, an effect that, that appears that way. 
but but you're right. You had a really good example. Also, the the first part of your question was the vacuum is light related to vacuum. Uh, that yes. Yeah, so also when you take I'm um, sorry one other digression when you take a laser beam and sweep it across the moon the light from the laser beam never goes faster than light. It always goes at exactly the speed of light. It is the spot on the moon, which is the unrelated superposition of where those photons are hitting, just like the garden hose water hitting the wall. It is the unrelated, um, those, where those photons hit, that appears to go faster than light. At no time does light itself ever go faster than light. Yeah, there's um, an the, other ex- really, the other really good point was, that was raised is, do you need vacuum to have light? And the answer is, we don't, we don't really know. That's right on the cutting edge of science. There are people who make um, the short horse effect, is that if you can change the vacuum, maybe you can very slightly speed up light speed. So it might be that light is tied to the underlying vacuum of the universe, uh, but we just don't know for sure. And these are topics of active research right now. So you've touched on something that's really fascinating, and it's a topic of research. We, we don't know the answer to everything. We don't know the answer to that one. There's a fun scenario you, you uh, write about in the book. I forget where it is in it, but it's an engineer on a train that's traveling at the speed of light, and he's got a ball in his hand, and he throws it forward. Does it travel faster than the speed of light? Yes, that's a common, uh, that's a very good question. It's a common question. So the, the train cannot pass you faster than light. And if the engineer throws off a ball that the engineer thinks is moving faster than the speed of light in the same direction, all we see is that ball moves closer to the speed of light, even though in the train frame that ball is moving close to the speed of light relative to this. We never see anything past the speed of light. So that ball could then throw off another ball that it thinks is moving you know, close to the speed of light, and we would not see that go faster than light. That would only be much, much closer, you know, infinitesimally closer to the, the maximum speed of the speed of light. So even if things keep throwing off faster things, we never see anything pass us faster than light. That's what Einstein said back in 1905, and that is what experiments continue to show today. Yeah, whenever I hear one of those train kind of questions, it reminds it takes me back to math classes in, in high school, and, and I get... I get scared about the whole thing because I know it's going to be something that's hard. Uh, east of the Rockies, the concept, Jimmy. The I'm concepts sorry. are simple, though. The math yeah, is I, a little complicated, but the concepts are simple. You, you just can't keep throwing things off. It just doesn't go faster than light. It just goes closer to light. Gotcha. Uh, east of the Rockies, Jimmy in Georgia. Hi, Jimmy. You're on with Robert hey. Nemiroff. Hello, George. You're the greatest. Your, your music playlist alone is worth the price of admission. <laughs> Let me give you an absurd premise, but I've got a serious question related to it, and I'd like a serious answer. A moon rover goes over the hill, and it finds a 1919 Ford Model T in pristine condition parked on the other side of it, and it appears to have been there since 1919. Here's my serious question, Robert. Would NASA tell us about it? So... Hello? Yeah. Could NASA tell us about – so not exactly clear on the question. So there's a car that's been sitting somewhere that's from 1919, and it's still sitting there. Can NASA tell about it? So I, I think I'm not giving justice to your question. NASA, I think he's asking would NASA – you, you had said NASA is transparent. Would, would NASA be transparent in finding something on the moon that doesn't belong there? Oh, yes, in my opinion. And, again, I don't speak on behalf of NASA. NASA would be immediately transparent on that. Uh, we don't. In general, NASA, to my knowledge, does not investigate cars that appear to have been sitting there since 1919 <laughs> because we're more interested in exploring the outer universe. Uh, that would be more the Department of the Interior or something else. But uh, if there was something unusual that was to occur on Earth, there would be some, there would be people who would investigate it and, uh, you know, things would come out. If, if NASA was involved, almost always it would be uh, very transparent. Okay. Uh, I think Jimmy was was uh, dubious about that. Uh, you know, we, we cover a lot of topics that touch on NASA here, and uh, uh, there, are, there are differences of opinion. I'll just put it that way. Go to the wild card okay. line. Brendan in Austin, Texas. Hey, Brendan. Hey, thanks so much, George and Professor Robert. I'll be super quick. I wish I could ask about the future Hadron Collider. And, George, the recent episode of Weaponized was fantastic. I'm looking forward to more. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Okaku said that society will change with quantum computing. And I know you said quantum mechanics doesn't affect the speed of light, but will quantum computing affect our ability to uh, compute the superpositions, as you were just mentioning a little bit ago? And 
Did you have a favorite UAP video that was re that had been released, or did you see the Border Patrol ones? Have you seen with the Tic Tac one that it's really bright, and Ukraine says that they have black Tic Tacs? Or do you think that light could be used as a fuel or propulsion for the UAP? Uh -huh. Wow, okay, a lot of questions there. Uh, first of all, quantum computing seems to be a really great um, thing that's developing. It's, uh, it's uh, ways of using quantum mechanics to uh, compute that classical computers, the way most computers work nowadays are just classical, um, and enables us to, to do things to solve problems that we uh, were not able to before. Right now, quantum computing isn't really doing much for us, but it's all about potential. And quantum computing has a lot of potential to, to help us compute things in the future. You have a, a famous a favorite. Uh, so again, the skeptic side of me says that when I see something I don't understand, uh, it intrigues me to try to understand more. But so far, uh, almost every time I've seen something like that, it just means that there's some kind of computer glitch that we didn't know about or some kind of observation that is seeing some kind of glint or something that, that we didn't know about. So almost all, so far as I can tell, when we investigate something, it, it almost always has a non-supernatural explanation that is plausible. And even though it's more fun to assume the non the non-normal explanation the skeptical side of me says yeah let's just go with the normal explanation first i know that's not what this audience wants to hear but uh you have to prove it so as carl sagan said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and so i need to see the extraordinary evidence for me to really believe some of those things are extraordinary well i would say that you know that if there's evidence for it then the claim isn't all that extraordinary to begin with the tic tac case that he was uh, the cases that he was talking about were seen or not computer glitches they were seen by the pilots um so you know um i i think those are those have been investigated by uh, our government the uap task force they haven't come up with an explanation for it yet but uh you know we we are welcome to all opinions here and Coast to Coast is used to hearing uh, a lot of one side of it, but your your viewpoint is certainly welcome uh, along with others. Uh, Bill in Los Angeles on the wild card line, what's on your mind? Oh, hi, George. Uh, yeah, similarly, I was uh, wanting to get uh, Dr. Nemiroff's opinion on how he accounts for the apparent 60,000-mile-per-hour speed of the Tic Tac Navy video and the, the pilot's own shock at what they were seeing. And how does he account for that data in terms of uh, earthly physics, or can he? Okay, so I'm not familiar with that case very much, other than seeing like a second or two uh, video on, on on the web or, or TV. So I really can't uh, address the specifics of the case. But uh, okay. many times, so there's a lot of things that scientists see that they don't understand. For instance, one one thing is like I don't know why the um, the laundry on the um, on the chair in the bedroom smells like root beer. I just <laughs> don't know why that is. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. But I don't attribute that to a supernatural thing. I don't think that extraterrestrials came in and dumped some kind of chemical. I think that maybe my kids spilled root beer and didn't tell me or something like that. So a lot of things we see in science we don't understand. But in order for it to be a supernatural explanation, we need to have verifiable results. We need to be able to reproduce it. We need to be able to predict something with it. And we have to be able to discount all the normal explanations. And I know that's not the audience. That's a, I think it's great fun to ponder these things. But my advice is to try to get even more extraordinary evidence and make predictions with it. Like, if this is true, then this must be true, and then we can go off and do that experiment. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's good advice. We're uh, Robert, we're out of time here. Thanks for all of our calls. Uh, and uh, Robert J. Nemiroff. Yes, sure. Thanks for having me. 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 The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.